So this unit is called the applications of the integral. So let's get right into what those are, okay? First one starts out pretty simple. It's a way for calculating average value of a function. Let's say I've got a curve that looks a bit like, let's say y equals rad, rad base 3x. That, okay? Let's say we were interested in calculating the average value, the average y value, the average height, you could call it, of the function from x equals 1 to x equals 8, okay? So x equals 1, x equals 8. That's the infinity sign, that's a sideways 8. Okay. So if you look at the region right here, you know, this, this creates an area, all right? And if you look at an area, an area can always be calculated in the form base times height equals area, okay? Now, that's easy to do when you have a convenient shape, like a square or a rectangle. But in this case, the same formula still holds true, except in this case you would say base times average height equals area. And that still holds true. If I find the average height, the average value of this function, then I can multiply that by the base to get the area. Now let me show you why that's so important. If I take the area and I divide it by the base, I get the average height of the function. Okay? We know the base. We know the value of the base. That's just the distance here, 8 minus 1. The base is 7. And the area of this section, hey, we just learned how to calculate area two units ago with integrals. The area of this section is the definite integral from 1 to 8 of rad base 3x dx. So if we take that and we divide it by the total uh, base length, multiply by 1 over 7, that equals the average height of the function. I hope that makes sense. You know, it's, it's rather straightforward. Maybe you need to watch this part again just to drill it into your mind. But that's how we calculate average height of a function. The total area, which is the integral, the definite integral, a to b, uh, multiplied by 1 over the base distance gives you the average height or the average value it's often called the average value of the function okay you just need to memorize that formula okay so a big part of this uh, unit is learning how to apply integrals in context all right so i think we went over this before but I'll just go over it again, just a quick review. We need to be able to relate the functions of position, uh, velocity, and acceleration to one another. We know that the antiderivative of acceleration equals the velocity function plus some constant c. And if you were asked to solve for the velocity function, they would likely give you uh, v of 0 equals something equals 5, or v of 1 equals 4, or they'd give you some value of the velocity function that you could use to solve for c. Okay, same thing holds true for the position function. That's the antiderivative of the velocity function, and the same process holds true. And uh, oftentimes what they will ask you to do is uh, they will ask you to do a definite integral of the velocity function v of x dx. And you will have to uh, conceptually know that, the def that a definite integral of the velocity function is an accumulation of change, it is an accumulation of velocity, it is uh, a total distance that you have traveled at this velocity, okay? So that's exactly what the definite integral tells you. Exactly how far did you travel, what distance did you go 
between time A and time B. You're going to need to be able to interpret that in context. And that goes for any rate, just doesn't need to be explicitly given to you as a velocity function. Uh, on my AP exam, uh, we were given a function c of x, which represented the rate at which cars entered a parking lot. It's a rate of change, the rate at which cars enter a parking lot. So that's conceptually the same thing as a velocity function. A velocity function is the rate at which uh, your distance changes. It's a rate. Okay. So if c of x is the rate at which cars enter a parking lot, then uh, the definite integral of c of x from time a to time b, dx, is the amount of cars that enter the parking lot from time a to time b. Okay? So you're going to need to be able to interpret what the integral means in context. Just keep in mind it's an accumulation of change. Also, don't forget what we uh, went over in our uh, first integral video. Whenever you do a definite integral, you know, it's always the same as finding area under the curve. So let's say this is my function c of x, and it's a straight line, let's say, okay? c of x is in the units cars per hour, the rate of change of how many cars enter the parking lot per hour. That's the y-axis, and the x-axis is in units of hours, okay? So if we take an area under the curve from one time to the next, time A to time B, then we are multiplying height times base, you know, that's where is it? That's hair, that formula holds true for all areas under the curve. All areas under the curve can be expressed as a base times height, with different numbers, of course. But as we perform a base times height, we also perform the same operations on the units. Cars per hour times hours gives you total cars, okay? That's why when I, when I did the integral, the definite integral of the rate of change of cars, I got a total amount of cars that entered the parking lot. Uh, another uh, very um, prevalent, it usually pops up uh, rarely once, mostly twice on FRQs, is interpret the meaning of this integral in context, and that you would write that out, what it means. So if, let's say, I was given the integral from uh, t equals 1 to t equals 6 of c of x dx, the correct interpretation of the meaning of this integral is the integral of blah, 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 you would write that in your answer, represents the amount of cars that enter the parking lot from time t equals 1 to time t equals 6 one pointer. Sometimes um, they give you time values and they say that time equals zero represents 6 a.m. Okay, and by that you would assume time equals one represents 7 a.m. and so on and so forth. Or hour equals one, whatever. In that case, you would write your interpretation as this integral, you would actually write out the integral, you don't say this integral, represents the amount of cars that enter the parking lot between 7 a.m. and 12 p.m. Okay, get as nested within the context of the problem as you can whenever you're asked a question like that. Okay, moving on. Uh, this, this is the beginning of a much larger unit. It's going to seem pretty simple right now, but make sure you're paying attention, make sure you're getting all this down, because this gets much more advanced really fast. So just make sure you get uh, the introductory steps we're going through right now. Now we're going to look at area between curves. We looked at area under the curve, now we're looking at area between curves, okay? So if I gave you two functions, y equals x squared and uh, what else? y equals 
sine x. Now, the first step is always identifying what your a and b are. But you're not given a and b. You're given y equals x squared, and you're given y equals sine x. You're not given a and b. But you see that a and b are the points of intersection between these two graphs. So you need to set x squared equal to sine x, and you need to solve for x. You need to solve for when these two uh, graphs intersect each other, and that's going to be your a and b. Okay, so once you've solved for your a and b, then you can go about finding this area, okay? A and B, as you might assume, are your bounds of integration. So, if we look at uh, the area under the curve of sine x from A to B, dx, that's this area inclusive of the area beneath uh, y equals x squared. That includes this area underneath as well. That's what this integral represents, but we don't want that area underneath. Well, that red area, that red area underneath x squared is the area under the curve of x squared. Makes sense, right? That's a to b of x squared dx. So if we want just the area in green, then we would do the area under the curve of sine x minus the area under the curve of x squared. Now, nobody wants to do two integrals, so if you remember uh, the very basic integral rules that we covered in our integral video, this can be rewritten as the integral from a to b of sine x minus x squared dx. And that right there represents the area between these two curves. What if the question asked you to uh, find the area between the curves, but it gave you these as functions of y, as in x equals arc sine y and x equals rad y. So these two are functions of y, but now, since they're functions of y, we would be finding the area in green with respect to dy, okay? So no more red area here. Now, if we wanted to find the area in green, we would effectively be looking at this graph sideways, okay? When we integrate with respect to y, we find the area between the y value and the y axis, not between the y value and the x axis, okay? Meaning that if we took um, the area between uh, the curve of x equals rad y, and the y-axis, which is x equals zero, then we would get green, green, green area, and then we would have a red area right here. Okay, so this area between the green area and the y-axis would be the part we don't want. Okay? So integrating with respect to y is something that's, you know, it's a little wonky, it's a little hard to wrap your head around for uh, some students because, you know, it's something different, it's something we haven't really seen before. This, of all things, is something you should really dedicate a lot of your practice on Khan Academy towards. Linked down below, again, it's Khan Academy, it's free, take advantage of the free practice problems. Also, I got my Discord server linked down there. If you want to uh, come ask me questions, need extra help, anything, I don't charge, obviously. Once you identify both your functions as functions of y, it follows the same uh, premise. Identify which function is above the other, or which function is farther from the y-axis than the other, and it's your further function minus your closer function 
and you put that in your integral from a to b dy from yeah y equals b to y equals a and you'd get the same area okay now if you'll see here the uh, example I just provided is not that simple. It, um, the curves intersect at a point between their bounds. So let me draw out an example for you, okay? Um, let's say we've got the line uh, y equals 0 0.5 and we've got sine x. Let's say they asked you to find the area from x equals 0 to x equals 5 pi over 6, okay? The area between the curves, so that would mean this area right here and this area right here. There's two areas between the curves now because they have an intersection point, meaning that you would need to calculate that intersection point and that intersection point happens at pi over 6, then you would calculate what kind of integral you would need to do. Well, let's reuse the uh, method that we've been using all this time. The larger function, the function that is further from the axis, which in this case is y equals 0 0.5, minus the one that's closer to the axis, sine x, dx, and we would integrate that from the distance where that holds true. Okay, then you ask yourself, on what interval is 0 0.5 greater than sine x? That's 0 to pi over 6. Okay, and then you add that to the other integral, which would be when sine x is greater than 0 0.5. And you would find the area between those curves, which is this area over here. Okay, on what interval is sine x greater than 0 0.5? From pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. And that right there would represent the area under the, the area between the curves in this example. Okay. Now, these integrals can get a bit messy, which is what I said before, they're oftentimes going to give you a calculator on these sections. You know, these are problems that will come up in multiple choice calculator and FRQ calculator sections. So next, we have to deal with uh, shapes with cross sections. That's the title of the unit. And uh, let, let me show you what we're gonna be doing here, okay? So let's continue with this example. I liked this example. You've got y equals x squared. You've got y equals sine x. Okay, so the question would tell you the base of a solid is the region enclosed by the graphs x squared and sine x referenced here. That's the base of a solid, okay? Now, if we were to draw a solid, let's say it's a rectangular prism, you know? It's a pretty bad rectangular prism, but you get the idea. Cross sections would be like little slivers, okay? Cross sections of the solid are perpendicular to the x-axis and they are squares, okay? So if you've got a rectangle right here, let's say that's your base, okay? Cross sections, let's say this is your x-axis, this line right here, perpendicular to the x-axis would mean this way, okay? So cross sections, perpendicular to the x-axis would look like that, and the question would tell you, Cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares or rectangles or semicircles or any shape. Let's say they're squares for the time being, okay? And they would look something like that. But that's a three-dimensional shape coming out of the page. It's a square, it's perpendicular to the rectangle, okay? 
and other cross sections would look the same. Such that as you combine all of the cross sections, you get a shape that looks like a square, if you look at it from this side, and a rectangle as you look at it from uh, our perspective. I'm going to try and throw a picture up on screen right now that uh, does a better job of illustrating what I'm talking about in 3D space. So that's what the question means when it says the base of a solid is the region enclosed by these two graphs and cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis or perpendicular to the y-axis are such and such a shape. You're trying to picture what that solid would look like. And this picture is what I think does, does that best. Gives you a visual representation of what the figure should look like. Cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares, okay? So this is going to be a three-dimensional shape. And how do we find the area of a three-dimensional shape that looks this wonky? With integrals, okay? And the way we use integrals is we take an infinitely small section, an infinitely thin cross-section of the shape, and we find the area of that, okay? So if we try and calculate volume, we know the formula for volume. Volume is length times width times height. This, this part of the equation, the length, is the area between the curves. The width, since we're taking infinitely small cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis, is dx. And the height, since this is a square, is the same as L, okay? Because the two sides are the same. Therefore, V can be rewritten as area between curve squared dx. That looks like something we can integrate. And it would look like the integral from, you know, your bounds a to b. Again, you're going to need to calculate where your bounds are, where these two functions intersect. And that's going to be um, your larger function minus your smaller function, sine x minus x squared, area between the curves squared, dx. You'd plug that into your calculator and you'd get an answer. Now, you should probably know how to do all of this stuff uh, with respect to y, like I, show, like I alluded to before. But really, on the exam, they're really never going to give you anything integrated with respect to y. Then Khan Academy uh, explains uh, the integrating with respect to y much better than I can. And he also draws much better pictures than me. So that should aid with your visual processing. If you want to learn more about integrating with respect to y, then go watch uh, the Khan Academy videos. Otherwise, you know, go practice. Now, I talked about other shapes before. We got to cover what those other shapes would look like. Let's say uh, the cross sections aren't squares, but they're triangles. The base is the area between the curves, and an equilateral triangle could be split up. If I show you here, it can be split up. That's a terrible equilateral triangle. It can be split up into two, two, 30, 60, 90 right triangles, okay? So your base here is your L, that's the area between your curves, and the height here is, if you remember, your 30, 60, 90 right triangles, this area, we need this area, it's L over two, multiplied by rad three. So now we know what our length is. You solve for that, that's still the area between curves. Our W, still dx, you know, if you're integrating with respect to the y-axis, like I alluded to before, that would be your dy. And the height, as we solved for right here, is L over 2 rad 3. So now we know our length, now we know our height. 
So we length times length over 2 rad 3, that's still length squared over 2 rad 3. Except that formula would give us the area of a rectangle like this. We're finding the area of the triangle. So instead of putting this over 4, over 2, we need to put it over 4. You know, because the formula for area of a triangle is base times height over 2. So that's your integral. Another type of shape you might get is semicircle. You know, it would look like that. Your radius, like this. So this obviously is going to be your length, that's going to be your area between your curves. And then we need to solve for the radius. What would the radius be? Well, it would just be L over 2, because L is the diameter in this case. Okay, now how do we solve for area of a semicircle? Well, area of a circle is pi r squared. Area of a semicircle is pi r squared over 2. And we know r equals l over 2. So that means r squared is l squared over 4. Carry over r2 here, and it becomes l over 8 times pi. Okay, that's your area of your semicircle. Hence, of course, don't forget, we have a width dimension to account for, dx. This becomes L squared, the distance between your curves, sine x minus x squared, over 8 times pi dx. Boom. And with respect to the rectangle uh, shapes you might get, the rectangle shapes are really the easiest ones. They would just say um, the area enclosed between these two curves is the base of a solid with cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis, which are rectangles. And, they, you, and you would say one side of the rectangle is the uh, length of the base, and then the problem would give you the height of the rectangle is 2, or the height of the rectangle is twice the base in which case you would just substitute h in for 2l. Okay, they, in the rectangle problems, they would always tell you what your h is, and it's just you to interpret what that h is. Next topic, solids of revolution. Oof. These ones are really fun to do on the whiteboard. Okay, so you could get a function, let's say y equals rad x, Okay, again, there are dy, y-axis counterparts to all these problems. Go watch Khan Academy's videos on those. They're, for all intents and purposes, not going to show up on the exam. Unless they're like really simple. And otherwise, okay. So. Let's draw y equals rad x. Look something like that, okay? Now, you would be given a problem that states a solid is created by revolving y equals rad x about the x-axis. Okay, so you take this and you revolve it around the x-axis. such that the area enclosed within that revolution creates a solid. Find the volume of the solid. All right, well, as you might have uh, guessed, we gotta use integrals to find the volume. Okay, so let's just try and quantify what this would look like. This is a circular-ish solid, okay? It, it, it's, this is a circular solid, okay? The function was rotated around a constant center, therefore it created a uh, coaxial shape. Okay. Whenever you do a solid of revolution like this, you know, everything has the same center. 
Therefore, this, if we look at it from, let's say, uh, this perspective, it would look like a circle with the center of that circle being the x-axis, or whatever axis you revolved around, and the exterior of the circle is the value of your function, y equals rad x. Therefore, we can say that the radius of our circle is the value of the function rad x. Okay, so how exactly do we find the volume of such a solid? Well, we can take cross-sections. If we take one cross-section here, one cross-section here, and take an infinite number of cross-sections and sum them all up with an integral, then we should get the volume. Okay, this, in this case, cross-sections are circles. We need to find the area of all the circles, and the area of the circle is, you know, pi r squared times the height dx, or the width in this case, the width of each circle, dx. So we just solved for what r is, so pi rad x squared dx. And since we're integrating with respect to x, we integrate from our bounds a to b. So uh, with all of these uh, area problems with integrals. These are something you're going to need a lot of practice with, uh, pretty much more practice than all of the other uh, topics that we've covered here with integrals, so I highly suggest you spend your time doing that before we move on, because this is, uh, this is the last dedicated integral unit. We move on to bigger and better things after this. You're still going to need to know integrals, mind you, but let's do another example. Let's say you're given y equals uh, x squared, okay? You're given a, b, and you're told this section of y equals x squared is revolved around the x-axis, okay? Such that it looks a little something like this with circular cross-sections. Same process still applies. We need to take circular cross-sections, okay? Where the, to find the area of each cross-section, we need to find the radius and the width. The width of each one, since they're infinitely small, the width is dx. So if we multiply the area of the circle, which is pi times the radius squared dx, and we integrate that, from our a to b, and we get the volume of this figure, of this solid. We need to solve for our r. Our r in this case is x squared. Therefore, our uh, function here, we plug in the integral from a to b of pi x to the fourth dx. We take the pi out, and you integrate that. Okay, now we're gonna take this and we're going to combine it with area between curves. Now this is, this is hyper zoomed in, okay? Because they don't intersect each other for a long time. They intersect once at zero and once at one. All right, and you're given that this area between the two curves is revolved around the x-axis. That's what you're told. Okay, so let's draw that out. This area here being empty space. That's not included in our area. Okay? So we're told that one bound is zero, one bound is one, because that's the point at which our x squared and our rad x intersect. And we're trying to find the uh, volume of this three-dimensional solid. Remember, it's both out of the plane of the page and into the plane of the page. It's a, it's a sphere-like surface, sphere-like figure. Okay, now let me show you how to calculate this area. 
The way we calculated our area before was we looked at cross sections, okay? Now, our cross section looks a bit different. We've got an outer radius, which in this case is the function y equals x squared. No, the outer radius is y equals rad x, excuse me. So this outer radius is y equals rad x, and the interior radius, let's say I took this cross section right here that I'm marking with my marker, let's say I took that cross section, and we've got an interior radius of y equals x squared, okay? And this area of the circle is volume that we care about, and the interior area is free space, is empty space, not included in our volume. Looks like a donut, doesn't it? This is called the washer method, but it should be called the donut method. Anywho, we need to be able to find the area of this cross section and then integrate that area with respect to dx, okay? Infinitely small area, remember that. And the way we do that is we find the area of the exterior circle, area equals pi r squared. The area of the exterior circle is r equals rad x, therefore the area x is pi times x, and the area of the interior is radius is x squared, the area of the interior is pi x to the fourth. Okay, it makes sense, because when you're less than 1, but greater than 0, x is a lot larger than x to the fourth. Okay, so the area of this is the area of the exterior, pi x, minus the area of the interior. So, it would be pi x minus pi x to the fourth. Pi x to the x minus x to the fourth. That is the area of your cross section integrate that with respect to dx. So we do our integral a to b, pi, the area of the exterior minus the area of the interior. This is different than before, okay? This is the total area of the exterior minus the total area of the interior circle. It's not the radius minus the radius, okay? We calculate our radius here, and we use it to calculate the final area of each circle. It's the area of the big circle minus the area of the small circle. This is not radius, and we integrate with that with respect to dx. And our a is 0, and our b is 1. Okay. Our final example is going to be when we rotate it around something apart from the x-axis. I know, this just keeps getting better, you know? So let's say I give you the graph, same two functions. y equals x squared, y equals rad x. All right, and you're given, and you need to find that, you, you're given the same two functions, y equals x squared, y equals rad x. And you are now asked to rotate them around the line y, uh, y equals negative 1. Right, does that make sense? No, that would be that would be down here. This is the line y equals negative 1. You're asked to rotate this around that line. Okay. So the process isn't that hard, it's not that daunting. I'll show you exactly what it's like. When we do that, when we rotate it around, it would, so this is the same area, and so we would start here. Yeah. Right. So this would be all empty space, 
and then the rest of our solid is around here. You know, think of it like this is my radius. I'm rotating it around this line. Boo, it's now out of the plane of the page, and it comes down right here. And it rotates back up into the plane of the page, come back right here. Because this line is our center point. And just like we do before, we take a cross section. Big cross section. Okay, your center point is the line y equals 1. You have um, your outer radius, which in each case is y equals rad x. And your inner radius, your inner radius, is going to be y equals x squared plus this distance from the distance between y equals x squared and y equals 1. Makes sense. That's your interior radius. It used to be the distance between y equals x squared and the x-axis, which is y equals 0, but now it's the distance between x squared and y equals 1. So it's y equals x squared plus 1. So we add that to our uh, interior radius now. And now it's the exact same process. It's exterior radius, I'm sorry, exterior area, just pi x minus interior area, which is pi x squared plus 1, all squared. All squared, don't forget that. Don't think this is x to the fourth plus one, it's all squared. And then that is what you put in your integral from zero to one dx. Okay, there's one more topic. Now don't, don't moan and groan just yet because uh, funnily enough, they left the easiest topic for last. Final topic, something called arc length absolutely no relation to the solids of revolution and all of this. Arc length. I give you a curve. Let's say it's y equals ln x. Okay? And I tell you to find the length of the curve from, uh, what would this be? y, I'm uh, sorry, x equals 1. That would be e. No. Yeah, no, x equals 1, which is right here, to, let's say, x equals, I don't know what that would be, 4. And I asked you to find the length of the curve. And you wouldn't know how to do that. It's not a straight line. How do, it's, not a, it's not an arc of a circle. How do, I, how do I do that? Well, let me show you. That's the beauty of integrals. You can reduce anything down to the infinitely small level and work from there. With Solids of Revolution, we took an infinitely small cross-section. So right here, we're going to do the same. We're going to take an infinitely small cross-section. Okay? Now, if you zoom super far in, let's say this is part of ln x, okay? You realize that you have a distance the horizontal distance and a vertical distance. You could say that horizontal distance is your change in x and the vertical distance is your change in y. Okay? Now as we reduce that down to the infinitely small level, if you guys remember local linearity from the derivatives unit, when we reduce something down to, when you reduce a differentiable function down to the infinitely small level, you get a straight line. Now, this is your change in x, and this is your change in y. Oh no, excuse me. This is your dy, this is your dx, because this is an infinitely small change. And local linearity holds true. The curve is now a straight line. So, the way we find the length of that is we take a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We do Pythagorean theorem. dx squared plus 
uh, dy squared all in the radical equals c, where c is the length of the hypotenuse. So this can be rewritten as rad 1 plus dy dx squared, okay? So this can be rewritten that way because you can never have a differential on its own, okay? An infinitely small change in x means nothing to us. An infinitely small change in x with respect to what? With respect to time? Infinitely small change in y with respect to what? Okay, y changed. Why does that matter? dy dx means something. dy dx is the rate of change of y with respect to x. And 1 is just dx dx, the rate of change of x with respect to x. And since that's the same as 1, we write it as 1. And 1 squared is 1, so that, that term reduces to 1. dy dx is what I wanted to draw your attention to, because that's the rate of change of the height of the function with respect to x. So now that we do that, this is our Pythagorean theorem. This is our arc length. This is our c, okay? So now what we can do is we just integrate all of the infinitely small arc lengths from 1 to 4 dx. And you're going to want to put your dy dx in terms of x if they give you a function that requires something like that. Okay, so just to reiterate, you don't necessarily need to know all of the conceptual application behind it, you just need to memorize the formula. Rad 1 plus dy dx squared is the length of the arc, and you put that in an integral from your, to your bounds of integration and that gives you the length of the arc, the length of the function, the length of the graph, the length of the line, from your first bound to your second bound. That's the applications of the integral. Thanks, guys.